The Continued Story of Terran, the Assistant Pigkeeper. I'm glad you've stayed to listen. Now sit round as Papa Bear reads a story. Chapter 13 The Hidden Valley. The impact of the heavy, furry body caught Terran full in the chest and sent him tumbling. As he fell, he caught a glimpse of Fluter. The bard, too, had been born to earth under the paws of another wolf. Ellen Restell stood, though a third creature crouched in front of her. Terran's hand flew to his sword. The gray wolf seized his arm. The animal's teeth, however, did not sink into his flesh, but held him in an unshakable grip. At the end of the ravine, a huge robed figure suddenly appeared. Melangar stood behind him. The man raised his arm and spoke a command. Immediately, the wolf holding Terran relaxed his jaws and drew away as obediently as a dog. The man strode toward Terran, who scrambled to his feet. "'You have saved our lives,' Terran began. "'We are grateful.' The man spoke again to the wolves, and the animals crowded around him, whinnying and wagging their tails. He was a strange-looking figure, broad and muscular with the vigor of an ancient but sturdy tree. His white hair reached below his shoulders, and his beard hung to his waist. Around his forehead he wore a narrow band of gold, set with a single blue jewel. "'From these creatures,' he said in a deep voice that was stern but not unkind, "'your lives were never in danger, but you must leave this place. It is not an abode for the race of man.' "'We were lost,' Terran said. "'We've been following our horse.' "'Melangar?' The man turned a pair of keen gray eyes on Terran. Under his deep brow, they sparkled like frost in a valley. "'Melangar brought me four of you. I understood young Gurgi was alone. By all means, then, if you are friends of Melangar. It is Melangar, isn't it? She looks so much like her mother, and there are so many I cannot always keep track of the names.' "'I know who you are,' cried Terran. "'You are Medwin!' "'Am I now?' the man answered with a smile that furrowed his face. "'Yes, I have been called Medwin. But how should you know that?' I'm Terran, of Caradalbin. Gwydion, Prince of Dawn, was my companion, and he spoke of you before before his death. He was journeying to Caradathel, as we are now. I never hoped to find you. You were quite right, Medwin answered. You could not have found me. Only the animals know my valley. Men Melangar led you here. Terran, you say, of Caradalbin? He met an enormous, put an enormous hand to his forehead. Let me see. Uh, yes, there are visitors from Caradalbin, I am sure. Terran's heart leapt. Hen Wen! he cried. Medwin gave him a puzzled glance. Were you seeking her? Now that is curious. No, she is not here. But I thought... We will speak of Hen Wen later, said Medwin. Your friend is badly injured, you know. Come, I shall do what I can for him. He motioned for them to follow. The wolves padded silently behind Terran, Elenwi, and the bard. Where Melangar waited at the end of the ravine, Medwin lifted Gurgi from the saddle, as if the creature weighed no more than a squirrel. Gurgi lay quietly in Medwin's arms. The group descended a narrow footpath. Medwin strode ahead, as slowly and powerfully, as if a tree were walking. The old man's feet were bare, but the sharp stones and pebbles did not trouble him. The path turned abruptly, then turned again. Medwin passed through a cut in a bare shoulder of the cliff, and the next thing Terran knew, they suddenly emerged into a green, sunlit valley. Mountains seemingly impassable rose on all sides. Here, the air was gentler, without the tooth of the wind. The grass spread rich and tender beneath him. Set among tall hemlocks were low, white cottages, not unlike those of Caradalbin. At the sight of them, Terran felt a pang of homesickness. Against the face of the slope, Behind the cottages, he saw what appeared at first to be rows of moss-covered tree trunks. As he looked, to his surprise, they seemed more like the weather-worn ribs and timbers of a long ship. The earth covered them almost entirely. Grass and meadow flowers had sprung up to obliterate them further and make them part of the mountain itself. "'I must say, the old fellow's well tucked away here,' whispered Fluter. "'I could never have found the path in, and I doubt I could find the path out.' Terran nodded. The valley was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. Cattle grazed peacefully in the meadow. Near the hemlocks, a small lake caught the sky and sparkled blue and white. The bright plumage of birds flashed among the trees. Even as he stepped across the lush green of the turf, Terran felt exhaustion drained from his aching body. "'There's a fawn!' Elenry cried with delight. 
From behind the cottages, a speckled, long-legged fawn appeared, sniffed the air, then trotted quickly toward Medwin. The graceful creature paid no attention to the wolves, but frisked gaily at the old man's side. The animal drew shyly away from the strangers, but her curiosity got the better of her, and soon she was nuzzling Elmy's hand. "'I've never seen a fawn this close,' said the girl. "'Akron never had any pets.' None that would stay with her, at any rate. I can't blame them at all. This one is lovely. It makes you feel all tingly, as if you were touching the wind. Medwin, motioning for them to wait, carried Gurji into the largest of the cottages. The wolves sat on their haunches and watched the travelers through slant slanted eyes. Taran unsettled Melangar, who began cropping the tender grass. Half a dozen chickens clucked and pecked around a neat white hen house. The rooster raised his head to show a notched comb. "'Those are Dalbin's chickens!' cried Taran. "'They must be. There's the brown hen, the white. I'd know that comb anywhere.' He hurried over and clucked at them. The chickens, more interested in eating, paid little attention to him. Medwin reappeared in the doorway. He carried an enormous wicker basket, laden with jugs of milk, with cheese, honeycombs, and fruits that, in the lowlands, would not be in season for another month. "'I shall look after your friend directly,' he said. Meantime, I thought you might enjoy... Oh, yes, so you found them, have you? He said, noticing Taren with the chickens. Those are my visitors from Caradalbin. There should be a swarm of bees, too, somewhere about. They flew away, Ted said Taren. The same day Henwen ran off. Then I imagine they came straight here, Medwin said. The chickens were petrified with fright. I could make no sense at all out of them. Oh, they settled down quickly enough. But, but of course, by that time, they had forgotten why they flew in the first place. You know how chickens are, imagining the world coming to an end one moment, one moment then pecking the corn the next. They shall all fly back when they're ready. Have no fear, though it's unfortunate Dolbin and Call should be put out of the matter of eggs. I would ask you inside, Medwin continued. But the disorder at the moment. There were bears at the breakfast, and you can imagine the state of things. So I must ask you to attend to yourselves. If you would rest, there is straw in the byre. It should not be too uncomfortable for you. The travelers lost no time helping themselves to Medwin's provisions, or in finding the buyer. The sweet scent of hay filled the low-ceilinged building. They scooped out nests in the straw, uncovering one of Medwin's breakfast guests, hurled up and fa fast asleep. At Fluter's, first uneasy, was finally convinced the bear had no appetite for bards, and soon began snoring. Ellen we dropped off to sleep in the middle of one of her sentences. Taran had no desire to rest. Midwin's valley had refreshed him more than a night's slumber. He left the byre and strolled across the meadow. At the far side of the lake, otters had built a slide, and were amusing themselves by tumbling down it. At Taran's approach, they stopped for a moment, raised their heads to look at them, as though sorry he was unable to join them, and returned to their game. A frish broke water and a twinkle of silver scales. The ripples widened until the last of them lapped gently at the shore. Medwin, Taran saw, had gardens of both flowers and vegetables behind the cottage. To his surprise, Taran found himself yearning to work with Call in his own vegetable plot. The weeding and hoeing he had so despised at Caradalbin now seemed, as he thought, of his past journey and the journey yet to come, infinitely more pleasant. He sat down by the rim of the lake and looked across the, to the hills. With the sun resting above the peaks, the wooden skeleton of the great ship stood out sharply against the mound which nearly enveloped it. He had little chance to study it, for Medwin disappeared. Walking deliberately across the field, the fawn trotted beside him. The three wolves followed. With his brown robe and white hair, Medwin looked as broad and solid as a snow-capped mountain. Gurji is more comfortable than he was, the ancient man said in his deep voice. The fawn danced at the lake. Sure, while Medwin ponderously sat down and leaned his huge head against, toward Taran. He will recover well. There is no longer any danger. Not at least while he is here. I have thought long of Gurji, Taran said, looking frankly into the old man's gray eyes. He explained, then, the reason for his journey and the events leading to Gurji's accident. Medwin listened carefully, head cocked to one side, thoughtful, while Taran recounted Gurji's willingness to sacrifice his own life rather than endanger the others. At first... I wasn't too fond of him, Taran admitted. Now I've become to like him in spite of all his whining and complaining. Every living thing deserves our respect, said Medwin, knitting his shaggy brows. Be it humble 
or proud, ugly, or beautiful. I wouldn't want to say the same thing about the Gwythanes, Terran answered. I feel only sorrow for those unhappy creatures, Medwin said. Once long ago they were as free as other birds, gentle and trusting. In his cunning, Oran lured them to him, and brought them under his power. He built the iron cages which are now their prison house in Anuvan. The tortures he inflicted on the Gwythanes were shameful and unspeakable. Now they serve him out of terror. Thus would he strive to corrupt every animal in Prydane, no less than the race of men. That is one of the reasons I remain in this valley here. Auron cannot harm them. Even so, were he to become ruler of this land, I doubt I could help them all. Those who fell into his clutches could be counted fortunate if they perished quickly. Terran nodded. I understand more and more why I must warn the Sons of Dawn. As for Gurji, I wonder if it wouldn't be safer for him to stay here. Safer? asked Medwin. Yes, certainly. But you would hurt him grievously were you to turn him away now. Gurji's misfortune is that he is neither one thing nor the other. At the moment, he has lost the wisdom of animals and has not gained the learning of men. Therefore, both shun him. Were he to do something purposeful, it would mean much for him. I doubt he will delay your journey, for he will be able to walk as well as you by tomorrow, easily. I urge you to take him. He may even help you find his own way of serving you. Neither refuse to give help when it is needed. Medwin continued, nor refuse to accept it when it is offered. Gwither, son of Gradol, learned that from a lame ant, you know. A lame ant? Terran shook his head. Dalbin has taught me much about ants, but nothing of a lame one. It is a long history, Medwin said, and perhaps you will hear it. All of it at another time. For the moment, you need only know that when Kilhutch, or was it his father? No, it was young Kilhutch. Very well. When young Kilhutch sought the hand of the fair Olwen, he was given a number of tasks by her father. You spotted on. He was chief giant at the time. What the tasks were does not concern us now, except that they were very nigh impossible, and Kilhutch could not have accomplished them without the aid of his companions. One of the tasks was to gather nine bushels of flaxseed, though there was scar scarcely that much in all of the land. For the sake of his friend, Gwythir, son of Gradol, undertook it to do this. While he was walking over the hills, wondering how he might accomplish the task, he heard a grievous wailing from an anthill. A fire has started around it, and the ants were in danger of their lives. Gwither, yes, I'm quite sure of it, was Gwither, drew his sword and beat out the fire. In gratitude, the ants combed every field until they had collected nine bushels. Yet the chief giant, a pecky and disagreeable sort, claimed the measure was not complete. One flaxseed was missing, and must be delivered before nightfall. Gwither had no idea where he could find another flaxseed. But at last, just as the sun had begun to set, up hobbled a lame ant carrying a heavy burden. It was the single flaxseed, and so the last measure was filled. I have studied the race of men, Medwin continued. I have seen that alone you stand as weak reeds by a lake. You must learn to help yourselves, that is true. But you must also learn to help one another. Are you not, all of you, lame ants? Terran was silent. Medwin put his hand into the lake and stirred the water. After a moment, a venerable salmon rippled up. Medwin stroked the jaws of the huge fish. What is this? What place is this? Terran finally asked in a hushed voice. Are you indeed Medwin? You speak of the race of men as if you were not one of them. This is a place of peace, Medwin said, and therefore it is not suitable for mankind. At least... Not yet. Until it is, I hold this valley for creatures of the forests and the waters. In their mortal danger they come to me, if they have the strength to do so, and in their pain and grief. Do you not believe that animals know grief and fear of pain? The world of men is not an easy one for them. Dalbin, said Terran, taught me that when the black waters flooded Pridane years ago, Nevid Nav Navin built a ship and carried with him two of every living creature. The waters drained away, the ship came to rest, no man knows where, but the animals who came safe again into the world remembered, and the young have never forgotten. And here, Terran said, pointing toward the hillside, I see a ship far from water. 
Gwydion called you Medwin, but I ask. I am Medwin, answered the white-bearded man. For all that my name may concern you, that is not important now. My own concern is for Henwen. You have seen nothing of her, then? Medwin shook his head. What Lord Gwydion said is true. Of all places in Prydain, she would have come here first, especially if she sensed her life in danger. But there has been no sign, no rumor, yet she would find her way, sooner or later, unless... Taran felt a chill ripple at his heart. Unless... She has been killed, he murmured. Do you think that has happened? I do not know, Medwin answered, though I fear. It may be so. Chapter 14. The Black Lake That night, Medwin prepared a feast for the travelers. The disorder left by the breakfasting bears had been cleared away. The cottage was snug and neat, though even smaller than Caradalbin. Darren could see that Medwin was indeed unused to entertaining human visitors, for his table was barely long enough to seat them all, and for chairs he had been obliged to make do with benches and milking stools. Medwin sat at the head of the table. <clears throat> the fawn had gone to sleep, but the wolves crouched at his feet and grinned happily. On the back of his chair perched a gigantic, golden-plumed eagle, watching every moment with sharp, unblinking eyes. Fluter, though still apprehensive, did not allow his fear to affect his appetite. He ate, an, he ate enough for all three of them, without showing the slightest sign of becoming full. But when he asked for another portion of venison, Medwin gave a long chuckle and explained to the amazed Pluter it was needed, not meat at all, but vegetables prepared according to his own recipe. Of course it is, Elmi told the bard. You wouldn't expect him to cook his guests for us, would you? That would be like asking someone to come to dinner and then roasting him. Really, I think bards are as muddled as assistant pickkeepers. Neither one of you seems to think very clearly. As much as he welcomed food and the chance to rest, Taran was silent throughout the meal, and continued so when he retired to his nest of straw. Until now, he had never imagined Henwen might not be alive. He had spoken again with Medwin, but the old man could give him no assurance, one way or the other. Wakeful, Taran left the byre and stood outside, looking at the sky. In the clean air, the stars were blue-white, closer than he had ever seen them. He tried to turn his thoughts from Henwen. Reaching Cairdathel was the task he had undertaken, and that in itself would be difficult enough. An owl passed overhead, silent as ashes. The shadow appearing noise, noiselessly behind him, was Medwin. Not asleep? Medwin asked. A restless night is no way to begin a journey. It is a journey I am eager to end, Taran said. There are times when I fear I shall not see Caradalbin again. It is not given to men to know the ends of their journeys, Medwin answered. It may be that you will never return to the places dearest to you, but how can that matter, if what you must do is here and now? I think, Taran said longingly, that if I knew I were not to see my home again, I would be happy to stay in this valley. Your heart is young and unformed, Medwin said. Yet if I read it well, you are of the few I would welcome here. Indeed, you may stay, if you so choose. Surely you can entrust your friends to, to the task. No, said Taran after a long pause. I have taken it on myself, through my own choice. If that is so, answered Medwin. Then you could give it up through your own choice. From all over the valley, it seemed to Terran, their voices came urging him to remain. The hemlocks whispered of rest and peace. The lake spoke of sunlight lingering in its depths, the joy of otters at their games. He turned away. No, he said quickly. My decision was made long before this. Then, Medwin answered gently, so be it. He put a hand on Terran's brow. I grant you all that you will allow me to grant. A night's rest. Sleep well. Terran remembered nothing of returning to the byre or falling asleep, but he rose in the morning sunlight, refreshed and fully strengthened. Elenwy and the bard had already finished their breakfast, and Terran was delighted to see that Gurji had joined them. As Terran approached, Gurji gave a yelp of joy and termed gleanful somersaults. 
Oh, joy, he cried. Gurji is ready for new walkings and stockings. Oh, yes, and new seekings and peekings. Great Lord has been kind to happy, jolly Gurji. Terran noticed Medwin had not only healed the creature's leg, he had also given him a bath and a good combing. Gurji looked only half as twiggy and leafy as usual. In addition, as he saddled Melangar, Terran found that Medwin had packed the saddlebags with food and had included warm cloaks for all of them. The old man called the travelers around him and seated himself on the ground. The armies of the Horned King are now a day's march ahead of you, he said. But if you follow the paths I shall reveal and move quickly, you may regain the time you have lost. It is even possible for you to reach Cairdathel a day, perhaps two, before them. However, I warn you, the mountain ways are not easy. If you prefer, I shall set you on a path toward the valley of your River Eastrad again. Then we would be forming, following the Horned King, Tyrion said. There would be less chance of overtaking him, and much danger, too. Do not think the mountains are not dangerous on their own, Medwin said, though it is a danger of a different kind. A phlegm thrives on danger, cried the bard. Let it be the mountains or the Horned King's hosts. I fear neither of them, not to uh, any great extent, he added quickly. We shall risk the mountains, Terran said. For once, Elenby interrupted, you've decided the right thing. The mountains certainly aren't going to throw spears at us, no matter how dangerous they are. I really think that you're improving. Listen carefully, then. Medwin ordered. As he spoke, his hands moved deftly in the soft earth before him, molding a tiny model of the hills, which Terran found easier to follow than Fluter's map scratchings. When he finished and the traveler's gear and weapons were secured to Melangar's back, Medwin led the group from the valley. As closely as Terran observed each step of the way, he knew the path to Medwin's valley would be lost to him as soon as the ancient man left them. In a little while, Medwin stopped. Your path, lot. Your path now lies to the north, he said. And here we shall part, and you, Terran of Caradalbin, whether you have chosen wisely, you will learn from your own heart. Perhaps we shall meet again, and you will tell me. Until then, farewell. Before Terran could turn and thank Medwin, the white-bearded man disappeared, as if the hills had swallowed him up, and the travelers stood by themselves on a rocky, windswept plateau. Well said Fluter, hitching up the harp behind him. I somehow feel as that if we meet any more wolves, they'll know we're friends of Medwin. The first day's march was less difficult than Terran had feared. This time he led the way, for the bard admitted, after a number of harp strings had snapped, that he had not been able to keep all of Medwin's directions in his head. They climbed steadily until long after the sun had turned westward, and, though the ground was rough and broken, the path Medwin had indicated lay clearly before them. Mountain streams, whose water ran cold and clear, made winding lines of sparkling silver as they danced down the slopes into the distant valley lands. The air was bracing, yet with a cold edge which made the travelers grateful for the cloaks Medwin had given them. At a long cleft, protected from the wind, Terran signaled a halt. They had made excellent progress during the day, far more than he had expected, and he saw no reason to exhaust themselves by forcing a march during the night. Tethering Melangar to one of the stunted trees that grew in the heights, the travelers made camp. Since there was no further danger from the cauldron-born, and the hosts of the Horned King moved far below them to the west of the group, Terran deemed it safe to build a fire. Medwin's provisions needed no cooking, but the blaze warmed and cheered them. As the night's shadows drifted from the peaks, Elenby lit her golden sphere and set it in the crevice of a faulted rock. Gurji, had, who had not uttered a single moan or groan during this part of the journey, perched on a boulder and began scratching himself luxuriously, although after Medwin's washing and combing, it was more through habit than anything else. The bard, as lean as ever, despite the huge amounts of food he had eaten, repaired his harp strings. "'You've been carrying that harp ever since I met you,' Eleni said, "'and you've never once played it. That's like telling somebody you want to talk to them, and when they get rid of the listen, you don't say anything.' Well, you'd uh, hardly expect me to go strumming airs while the cauldron-born warriors were following us, Fluter said. Somehow, I didn't think it would be appropriate, but a flam is always obliging, so if you'd really care to hear me play, he added, looking both delighted and embarrassed. He cradled the instrument in one arm, and almost before his fingers touched the strings, a gentle melody, as beautiful as the curve of the harp itself, 
lifted like a voice singing without words. To Terran's ear, the melody had its own words, weaving a supple thread amongst the rising notes. Home, home, they sang. And beyond the words themselves, so fleeting he could not be quite sure of them, were the fields and orchard or orchards of Caradalbin, the gold afternoons of autumn, and the crisp winter mornings with pink sunlight on the snow. Then the harp fell silent. Fluter sat with his head bent close to the strings, a curious expression on his long face. Well, that was a surprise, said the bard at last. I had planned something a little more lively, the sort of thing my war leader always enjoys, to put us in a bold frame of mind, you understand. The truth of the matter is, he admitted with a slight tone of discouragement, I don't really know what's going to come out of it next. My fingers go along, but sometimes I think this harp plays of itself. Perhaps, Fluter continued, that's why Tellison thought he was doing me a favor when he gave it to me. Because when I went up to the Council of Bards for my examination, I had an old pot one of the minstrels had left behind, and I couldn't do more than plunk out a few chants. However, a flam never looks a gift horse in the mouth, or, in this case, I should say harp. It was a sad tune, Ellen, we said. But the odd thing is, you don't mind the sadness. It's like feeling better after you've had a good cry. It made me think of the sea again, though I haven't been there since I was a little girl. At this, Taryn snorted, but Ellen we paid no attention to him. The waves break against the cliffs and churn into foam, and further out, as far as you can see, there are white crests. The white horses of Lear, they call them, but they're really only waves, waiting their turn to roll in. Strange, said the bard. Personally, I was thinking of my own castle. It's small and drafty, but I would like to see it again. A person can have enough wandering, you know. It made me think I might even settle down again and try to be a respectable sort of king. Caradolvin is closer to my heart, Taran said. When I left, I never gave it too much thought, but now I think of it a great deal. Gurji, who had been listening silently, set up a long howl. Yes, yes, great, some great warriors will all be back in their halls, telling their tales with laughings and chaffings. Then it will be the fearful forest again for poor Gurji to put down his tender head in snoozings and snorings. Gurji, Taran said, I promise to bring you to Caradalbin. If I ever get there myself, and if ever you like it, and Dalbin agrees, you can stay there as long as you want. <clears throat> what joy, Gurji cried. Honest toiling, Gurji extends thanks and best wishes. Oh yes, fond and obedient Gurji will work very hard. For now, obedient Gurji had better sleep, Taran advised, and so should we all. Medwin has put us well on our way, and it can't take much longer. We'll start again at daybreak. During the night, however, a gale rose, and by morning a drenching rain beat into the cleft. Instead of slackening, the wind gained and forced and screamed over the rocks. It beat like a fist against the traveler's shelter, then pried with searching fingers as if to seize and dash them into the valley. They set out nevertheless, holding their cloaks before their faces. To make matters worse, the path broke off entirely, and sheer cliffs loomed ahead of them. The rain stopped after the travelers had all been soaked to the skin, but now the rocks were slippery and treacherous. Even for a sure-footed Melangar, stumbled once, and for a breathless moment Taran feared she would be lost. The mountains swung a half-circle around a black lake, and sullen below threatening clouds, Taran halted at an on-and-out cropping of stone and pointed toward the hills on the far side of the lake. According to what Medwin told us, he said to the bard, we should make for that notch, all the way over there, but I can see no purpose in following the mountains when we can cut almost straight across. The lake shore is flat, at least while there, while here is getting practically impossible to climb. <clears throat> Fluter rubbed his pointed nose. Even counting the time it would take us to go down and come up again, I think we should take save several hours. Yes, I definitely believe it's worth trying. Medwin didn't say anything about crossing valleys, Ellen we put in. Well, he didn't say anything about crossing cliffs like these either, answered Tairn. They, they seem nothing to him. He's lived here a long time. For us, it's something else again. If you don't listen to what somebody tells you, Ellen we remarked, it's like putting your fingers in your ear and jumping down a well. For an assistant peakkeeper who's done very little traveling, you suddenly know all about it. 
Who found his way out of the barrel? Taren retorted. It's decided. We crossed the valley. The descent was laborious, but once they had reached ground level, Taren felt all the more convinced they would save time. Holding Melangar's bridle, he led the group along the narrow shore. The lake breached closely to the base of the hills, obliging Taren to splash through the shallows. The lake, he realized, was not black in reflection of the sky. The water itself was dark, flat, and as grim and heavy as iron. The bottom, too, was as treacherous as the rocks above. Despite his care, Taren lurched and nearly got a ducking. When he turned to warn the others, to his surprise, he saw Gurgian water up to his waist and heading towards the center of the lake. Fluter and Ellen, we were splashing further and further from land. Don't go through the water, Taren called. Keep to the shore. Wish we could, the bard called, shouted back. But we're stuck somehow. There's a terribly strong pull. A moment later, Taren understood what the bard meant. An unexpected swell knocked him off his feet, and even as he put out his hands to break his fall, the black lake sucked him down. Beside him, Melangar thrashed her legs and whinnied. The sky spun overhead. He was pulled along like a twig in a current. Ellenwee shot past him. He tried to regain his footing and catch her. It was too late. He skimmed and bobbed over the surface. The, far <clears throat> the far shore would stop them. Taran thought, struggling to keep his head above the waves. A roar filled his ears. The middle of the lake was a whirlpool, clutching and flinging him to the depths. Blackwater closed over him, and he knew he was drowning. This concludes Chapter 14 of Terran's Adventures. Thank you for listening, and remember, have a good day. You deserve it.